So welcome, excited to be here. I am gonna dive straight in. We are gonna talk about sustainable career change. I like that word, sustainable, because it implies uh, being thoughtful. Doesn't mean that change is permanent, but it means that we're gonna be uh, really informed with anything that we make happen in our next steps in our career, right? Um, so super quickly, my background, I started out at Goldman Sachs and then Bridgewater, which is a, first a bank and then Bridgewater is a hedge fund. Um, I did some HR research after that. I did my uh, coaching training through NYU, got certified through the International Coach Federation. I did a tech MBA at NYU Stern. And then I was doing career coaching at a variety of organizations, Flatiron School, Columbia University, uh, WeWork, um, and Project Activate and also taught an entrepreneurship class at Binghamton. And the main thing here is my company, which I've been building for almost five years now. And we really build digital tools to help uh, each and every professional to be informed and intentional with every career decision that you make, whether you are figuring out your direction, deciding on upskilling, improving your personal branding, job searching, or just looking to get you know, an advancement and promotion. Uh, we really wanted to create tools and frameworks to help you um, have the space and the structure and the guidance to work through all of that in a way that feels good to you. Um, oftentimes we just sort of dive into the job search uh, without knowing really what we want. So we wanted to create that space and support. Um, so, uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about just kind of the state of the working world. We're going to talk about uh, why it's important to find a job you love, some common limiting mindsets, a mental model you can use for your next work opportunity, uh, how to actually pursue a process to clarify your ideal best fit direction, and even walk through a self-reflection exercise that's going to get the wheels turning uh, for what it is you're uh, most interested in, in, in your next steps in your career. And at any point, um, feel free to submit your questions. Um, all right. So first and foremost, I like to start out with a little context. A majority of employees are disengaged at work, right? And so the reason I say this is so that a, like, you don't feel alone. It's okay if you're not feeling 100% in your work. It's very possible that uh, the existing systems and tools that we all have available to us aren't really always the most effective to enable you to find the best fit path. And that's why we're here today. Um, and it's okay. So I, I say this just to make sure you feel like you're not alone, right? It's okay to figure out where we need to improve things um, and where things may not be going so perfectly. Um, and, and at work, of course, it does affect our well-being. So I say this to remind you that it's important and it's okay to be thinking about where you're at professionally. And it is a big part of your life. And thus, it requires its due time and effort and thought to actually work on that journey and figure out where you want to go. Uh, this is a little dismal, but most would say they don't find their work meaningful, don't think their lives are going well, or don't feel hopeful about the future. I didn't write that quote. Uh, a little bit dismal. Again, I only say this just so that you don't feel alone if you're feeling a little down or not perfect with your career path right now. Um, there's also a recent article I found about uh, the misalignment with one's personality when you're figuring out your career path. That's really a lot of kind of the work that I do is helping you figure out what feels aligned and suitable given what you're like, right? And that's what we're going to talk a lot about today. Um, so we're going to dive into, you know, again, if you're feeling any misalignment with your current path, we want to figure out, is it the role? Is it the industry? Or is it the environment? Or is it some combination of the three? Again, why is this so important? There's a lot of research out there talking about sleepwalking through one's career, the purpose gap that exists, and it affects you, right? It affects your, your potential, your wealth potential. It affects physical and mental health, and it affects actually the impact of companies and society at large. So the best thing I believe that we can do is be in a job where we can be our most innovative and productive self right? That's the best thing you can do for yourself and for others. So 
the irony here is we all want a job that we're happy with, but there's actually benefits beyond just the obvious to doing it. Um, you get better at that job when you're enjoying it, you make more money and you make more money faster. Um, it also makes for a much more efficient and effective job search, right? Oftentimes, like I said earlier, we jump into the job search without really knowing what we want. And that can be overwhelming and confusing and sort of lackluster in terms of, you know, when we show up to interviews, we really want to be as compelling as humanly possible with a story that makes sense. The only way to have that story make sense is to first figure out what the story is. And that's something you can do on your own before you dive into any interview or job search process. It also makes for a much more organic career development, right? Much easier to pave, okay, not just what comes next, but what comes after that and after that, right? So the next, next steps in your journey become much easier and more organic to figure out where things sort of go naturally and they let it sort of build on itself when you get into the first uh, or the next role that feels really right for you. It makes all those future steps a lot easier to pursue. Also, it just feels good, right? I have clients that come to me where it's like feeling stressed, and then by the end of it, you're leaving feeling relieved and excited. And I know that feeling might seem, is it even possible? I can tell you that it is. Um, but as we saw, the majority may not feel that way. So it's not always the example that you see around you. And yet I'm here to teach you how to get to that feeling. We want to feel relieved and excited about the journey ahead. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk super quickly about common limiting beliefs and mindsets that usually get in someone's way and how to kind of flip them on their head. Uh, the mindset is super, super important. It's, uh, you know, it, it affects all of our decisions. So these might be feelings you resonate with that you may not even have realized were getting in your way, but we do want to make sure you're feeling open minded, confident, and positive about the path forward before you start acting and making decisions and taking actions in your job search. So the first thing is stress, right? Um, you know, it is normal and natural to feel, if you're feeling stress, it means that you care, right? Which is good, but we don't want you to like operate necessarily when you're in a feeling of stress. When you're feeling that job stress, oftentimes our instinct is like, the quick solutions of just job hopping or applying to something randomly online. So whenever you're feeling that stress, I always say, hands off the keys, right? And then let's just take a moment and figure out how to apply some structure. The reason I say structure is because you want to ask yourself, why am I feeling stressed? Is it because I don't know what I want next? Is it because I'm not getting wherever I want to go and I've been putting in effort? Whatever that reason is or the goal is, we want to work backwards and say, what would be a good set of steps to get from A to Z versus just like jumping to operate out of that feeling of stress? Security. It is important to find a path that can take care of you and your life. Financials are a critical component of finding a job. However, if you solely make decisions out of a place of security, I have seen it time and time again, either you're not gonna end up liking it or you're not gonna do well or whatever it may be, but it's not really secure if that's your only reason for choosing that path. I usually say the path you're most interested in is the most secure path. It's kind of rare to see the person on the team who really wants to go above and beyond. So you do wanna think about both security and not just interest, but what am I really aligned with and what path fits with my skills, my strengths, my affinities, what I'm natural at, what I'm great at, all of those components are important, right? Oftentimes we sort of assume that we can't pursue something. I I'm here to tell you, let's learn before we figure out if we can or can't do it. Learn about the reality and the patterns and the nuances of how people get hired into that path and how, you know, literally get those stories so that you have the information to figure out is that a journey I want to go down? Is that something I feel capable of or excited to even learn or not, right? We often look at our past in the sense of, you know, here's what I've done and that's all I can do going forward. Uh, while recruiting often does, you know, look at transferable skills, your story makes so much more of a difference than your past journey. 
right? If you have done the due diligence to really understand a certain role and a certain industry and why you're a fit so much so that you actually believe it, it's going to be way more compelling in an interview to hear that. So many people show up to interviews, just checking the box, saying what they want, what the person wants to hear. But if you truly have that information and a story that aligns, it is going to go a very, very long way. A lot of times people think about the long term, right? So I'm here to say, I'd rather you think about the short term. Now, we do want you to understand what the next role could be and also where it could lead you down the line. But I personally am not of the belief that like, if you just say, oh, here's where I want to be in X number of decades, let me reverse engineer because you're going to change. The world's going to change. So much could change by that point. But if you were to say what next role or team or department or company or industry is something that I'm really a fit with and something I'm really excited to do, it's going to set you up for the second and third opportunity thereafter in a way that you might not even have known those things existed. So really over-index on what would be an amazing fit for me right now. And then yes, understand where that role could lead, but there's probably a few different ways it could lead, right? A lot of times people say, I'm open. I'm open to any role. I'm open to any industry. To me, that means it's a signal that we haven't done enough learning or reflection to get the clarity on what is right for you. So I'd rather you be picky. Just because you have a narrow direction doesn't mean you're going to have less opportunities. We want to find more of the right thing. But if you're looking for two or three different types of roles or two or three, I mean, sort of less concerned about industries, let's just take roles for a second. Um, if you're looking at two or three or even four different types of roles, what are the odds? Like, what if you land in that fourth role? Maybe it's Maybe you're like, oh, that's okay for me, but why not just say, okay, this role is my number one, this role is my number two. Let me go find more of what I know is the best possible fit for me, right? We often choose directions that we're aware of. Um, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I'm exploring these options. I'm looking into this. I'm learning about that, um, right? So there's over 160,000 unique roles in the US alone, doesn't mean you have to learn about every single one, but it is okay to and encouraged to take the time to explore, to figure out what it is you do want. And if you're still looking into things, I'd rather you say that when you're networking so that maybe they can introduce you to a few people within the different roles that you're considering. You, I think sometimes we feel forced to like have that answer, right? It's okay if there's options on the radar. Um, oftentimes we think about interviewing well, it's sort of this like thing that we have to check the box and do well. I'd rather you think about conversations that you want to have. Who do you want to talk to about what and where, right? These conversations are a mirror into the work you may do. You're going to be talking about problems that hopefully you'll be in the driver's seat to solve. So you really want to ask yourself, who do I want to talk to about what, where? right? It's a conversation and it's a mirror. We often think about applying, applying, applying. I'm here to say explore. It's okay to take the time to learn and reflect and research and network and really figure out what is a fit for you before you apply anywhere. Cannot say that enough. It is important and encouraged to explore before you start applying. And we often look at others around us, and that's very natural. I just wrote a blog about how we oftentimes compare ourselves to others on LinkedIn. It is normal. As humans, we do this. But I want you to bring it back to you. You are the one living and breathing your job every single day. You are the one feeling whether you're hating it or not. You are the one who's going to feel those Sunday scaries or the morning, Monday morning dread, right? So yes, you have your family around you and you might be taking care of people, but they also want the best for you. They want, you know, you're the happiest version of you. So really utilize others if it is a positive source of inspiration. But if you find yourself in that rabbit hole, um, I would really just try to sort of put a pin in that social media scrolling and just say, what is my goal and what can I do to take that next step forward? If I can learn from someone else in a positive way, great. If I'm just feeling down right now, then I'm just going to close out of whatever it is that, it, you know, social media is a tricky place, right? And fear. We often feel 
fear when it comes to our careers, I always say replace fear with learning. If you have a hesitation or something you're not certain about, can that be a question and can that question be an answer? And if you have information, can you use that to make a better decision? You might also just need reflection about, you know, everything you're hearing. If you're gathering information, what can you do with all of that? How does that relate back to you? So if you're feeling any sense of fear or stress, how can we turn that into something actionable, whether it's gathering information or doing a little reflection to help you figure out what's next for you? Um, I see some questions. So I'm going to take a super quick pause to uh, jot down to, to take one question and then we'll keep going. Um, so I see a question. I want to make a career shift and take a three month tech boot camp, but I'm not in a position to leave a full time job. What's your advice? Um, so if you are ready to make a pivot, but you can't leave, there's a lot that you can do on top of your job. I mean, you do want to learn the nuances of like, what does it require? Is this boot camp sufficient for me to make the pivot I want to make? But a lot of those boot camps do offer part-time programs, whether you're going to do boot camp, course, certification, or even just like pro bono work on the side, any sort of skill development can be done on the side of your job. Now, again, that takes a lot, that takes time, takes effort and it takes accountability. But even if you space it out and do a little bit each week, you know, what could get done in the span of six to nine months, versus not doing anything at all. So it might sound like a long time, but just getting started and putting in one to two hours a week could get you a long way in six months time. But the, the key to pivoting is really understanding what skill development would be sufficient. Let me learn from people who have made that leap to make sure I know going into that skill development, what's gonna be the best use of my time as it relates to different learning opportunities. Hopefully that helps answer your question and let me know if there's follow-ups. I'm going to keep going and I will pay attention to the Q&A as well, okay? So how to think about your next work opportunity. The first thing I like to think about is the function, right? So this is, sorry, it's very loud here. Um, I'm going to let it pass quickly. So. Function means your day-to-day, -day, the skills, the projects, the activities, those verbs and the action phrases. What are you natural at, your affinities? You know, what do you enjoy doing? That's what function means. Um, the second piece is content. Content relates to topic areas or problem areas that you find important or interesting. And the third is the environment. What should it look and feel like? The people, the pace, remote, travel, all that kind of stuff. The words we usually hear are role, industry, and culture. Those are the commonly used words. But when you bring it back to the root, what is the role? The role is the function and the style of the activities that you're doing all day. The industry is what is the problem we're all here to solve? And do I feel aligned with that? Do I feel that it's important to me and interesting? And the culture reflects the environment. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick question. I finished certifications in UX and looking to get into research and it's been two years studying networking and I have so much more to learn. I also need to start working right away. Um, so UX, like other sort of technical pivots, it's one of those things that designers often feel like it's never done, their portfolio is never done and the work is never done and the learning is never done. And that's very often true. But when you're pivoting again, I would really re- focus on chatting with designers who are like either junior or around your level, that new kind of sort of lower level if you're first starting, and then really understand like, do you need to see three different project examples in my portfolio? Or do you need to, what sort of breadth of experience do you need to see both from formal training as well as project-based experience in order to get hired into this junior role? The other thing with pivoting, it's like any job search. You need to think about simply the best practices, which is making sure that you're networking as a way of getting the foot in the door. We can't just rely on those online applications. So, um, you know, when you say two years studying and networking, I would also just think about um, have you had support and guidance to know how to go about 
networking in the best strategic way and all the information that you are gathering and learning about how people make that pivot, are you utilizing that to your advantage? It's hard to answer quickly because there's so many best practices with job search, but if you can get another pair of eyes to see like, here's what I've been doing, here's what's working, here's what's not, and make sure you can really pivot, um, you know, like, like any sort of iterative process, a lot of these tech processes are agile. You want to pivot the same way in your job search. What are you doing? What's working? What's not? How do I adjust accordingly so that you're not just doing the same thing and then expecting different results? Okay. Um, it's a quick answer to your question. I'm sure I can dive in deeper. I'm going to keep going. So career exploration, what is it? It is a process that is distinct from and a precursor to the job search. It includes steps of practical learning and reflection to compare, contrast, and clarify which path you are confident pursuing. And by the way, this could relate to the path or it could relate to just what is your next step. The key here is that before you job search, you just simply want to make sure you know what's right for you and what you're going after. Why is it so important? We've sort of touched on this a little bit. Making sure your job search is efficient, making sure that your interviews are compelling, and making sure that you actually increase the odds that you're going to like the job once you get there. That's what exploration will do for you. So here's how to go about the exploration process. First, you want to commit. You got to ask yourself, am I in a moment of trying to figure out what it is I want and what's right for me? That's a decision, right? Committing to the process. Then you want to reflect. Today, I think we'll have time. We can dive into actually that self-reflection exercise, but you really want to reflect on those three things. If you remember the earlier slide, which is the function, the content, and the environment. So you really want to deeply understand affinities, tendencies, the natural style of how you want to work, the problems you care about, and the environment that you thrive in. Then you want to come up with roles and industries that are options. Most assessments spit out an answer, but in this case, we'd rather you say, what roles or industries feel potentially viable or relevant? Let me look into it. Then, of course, we can do a little bit of online research, but the main thing is networking. There's a lot we could talk about with networking, but you really want to get creative. We actually have a really good list of networking questions on our website, but what can you ask to get really deeply accurate information so that you could picture what does this role actually look and feel like? What does this industry actually look and feel like? You want to picture it so clearly that like, you know what it would be like to walk in tomorrow and do that job. Experiential learning, I usually leave towards the end because you can't take every course and every certification. Once you feel 95% certain that that path is right for you, dive in to test it out in a small way, course or certification, shadowing, volunteering, whatever it may be, to see how you can dabble with that type of work and see if it's right for you. And the key here is reflection and iterating. So after you start learning about these roles and industries, you might learn about a role that isn't right for you or it is right for you. So you really want to go through this process and give yourself the time to figure out, you know, how can I compare and contrast these options and which one is the best fit for me? Uh, that's what gets you to the fact of having a clear direction. That's when you begin to edit your personal branding materials, deciding on upskilling and job searching. And that's really what leads to the job fulfillment process. This could take a month or two or three with consistent effort. The fact is, it is feasible to get to that point of certainty. It might take a little time, but it is well worth it to make sure you feel good about what's next for you. I'm going to take a quick question here in the chat. Um, so you've got experience in PR and marketing. You're thinking about moving into talent acquisition. You've been doing freelance recruiting for a small company. Um, what level of roles in talent should I be looking for? Uh, that's a really good question. Sometimes when you're pivoting, it's a little hard to know how to deal with the levels. If you have experience, you don't necessarily have to start in an entry level coordinator role. I think if you have seven years, you might look at like sort of associate level, maybe the second level after um, entry, like a, somewhere in the range of associate, um, because your experience just as a, you know, a, a professional is still transferable. Your ability to operate in the workplace, your soft skills, your ability to know how and when to ask questions and escalate, all of that is relevant that you're going to bring to that new job. Um, and I love that you've been doing this side gig to get that TA experience. Um, so I think roughly associate, if you have management experience, could be a manager, but 
you know, the, the thing about pivoting is even if you start out in an associate role, if the company is one where you can ask how they do promotions, like if they promote off cycle, not only at performance review time, you might get a promotion in six months. Like again, when you come in with experience, you might have to start sort of a little lower than where you are now. But if you make sure it's a company that sort of empowers people and promotes people based on that meritocratic sort of, uh, you know, mindset or approach, that would be a great place to make a pivot. Um, or, I mean, even if they promote based on yearly performance reviews, you, you can ask a lot about how they handle, you know, promotion and get deep into understanding that. So that way you feel like you can sort of rise back to the level that you were at. I hope that answers your question on pivoting. And of course, let me know if there's follow-ups. So remember, if you still have options, you haven't done enough learning or reflection. Learning and reflection is the key to thinking about a sustainable career change because you really want to make sure the next path ahead is the right fit for you. And learning and reflection are the keys to be doing that. Um, so if you guys are cool with it, we can do a self-reflection exercise. Um, I will pay attention if there's more questions, but I hope this will help you in your journeys. So feel free to get a pen and a paper, and I'm going to prompt you through some uh, reflection uh, prompts, and you can just sort of jot down things that come to your mind, um, and uh, we're going to sort of help you dive into what you really want and what you're looking for in your next steps. So I am going to just dive right in. So if you remember those, that three-part framework, right? So the first part is, and by the way, um, you can type this stuff out if you have an open notepad digitally, but I definitely encourage handwriting. It definitely helps. So again, that first section is all about the style of the work. So I'm gonna just dive in, give you some prompts, and um, you can sort of see what comes to your head. You don't have to write full sentences, just keywords that come to your mind. So you wanna start by thinking of a few experiences that ideally were experiences that you chose to take on. It could be a project at work, um, it also could be something you've done outside of work. So really starting to think about experiences that were interesting to you, that you enjoyed, um, that you maybe chose to start or take on. Um, and again, think broadly in work, out of work, and you could go back however far you need to. So I'll give you a few seconds on each prompt. Just start to jot down keywords that come to your head. And I want you to start to pick the top one, right? Like pick one that's your number one sort of most interesting experience to you. And you want to start to list out the verbs of what went into that experience. Like what were those verbs and action phrases that describe the things you had to do, those sub elements of like what went into that experience? What were you actually doing? Usually these are verbs or action phrases to start to flesh out what you were doing in that experience. And now I want you to add to the list. So you've started this list of verbs and action phrases. Now you can sort of zoom out and like look at that list and just continue the list as if it's like, these are things I like doing. These are things I'm good at. These are things I enjoy. Verbs and action phrases. What else do you want to add to that list? If someone were to ask you to do a project today, what would it be? Picture you're in like arbitrary role, arbitrary company. They're paying you. It's not your current role. If somebody were to ask you to do a project, like what should they, without what should they ask you? It's not about your capabilities. What would you want them to task you with as a project? What would you be like excited to do as a project?
think of times that you've helped others or what others come to you for help with. What do you like? What do you enjoy helping others with? Okay, we're gonna move on to section two. Section two is what I call content. So we're gonna dive in, essentially. We're gonna start with topics that you like to read about or maybe even listen to, whether it's news, podcasts, accounts you follow, people you follow, social media, articles you click on. What are those topics that you seek out or you click on? you read about, you sort of digest that information, you enjoy learning about it. What are those topics or problems, um, topic areas, problem areas that you digest, you know, that content around, that you seek out that content around? And the second uh, question is, what problems in this world do you feel need solving? There are so many out there, but if you had to start to like prioritize, here are the problems that you really find important or interesting, or really just sort of like, how does this still exist type thing, right? Problems that you care about, that you I want to contribute your time towards, but I don't even want you to think of it so much as a work setting just yet. I really just want you to think about problems out there that, that are meaningful to you, interesting to you. Our world is full of them, right? How does this still exist? What comes to your head? And topics you love learning about or talking about with others, right? If you seek out, you know, something to actually learn in your free time or just like conversations you enjoy having, it could even be with friends or colleagues. Sometimes it's like topics we talk so much about that people are like bored listening to us, right? But you could talk about it forever. If you notice, I'm sort of screaming, right? I, I talk fast and loud when it comes to careers. So where do you get that energy? Where do you get fired up? when you're talking about something or thinking about it or just seeking it out to learn more about it. You can also think about products or services that you find interesting. This could be like a digital app or service. It could be like a brick and mortar store or somewhere you walk in on a weekend, or it could be literally anything you've used personally, something you interact with, something you utilize at home, um, any sort of product or service that you find interesting, innovative. Maybe you've recommended it to your friends to try or check out products or services that you find interesting. Now we're gonna talk about the environment. So this is all about what does it look and feel like um, to, um, <clears throat> what does it look and feel like to, uh, in an environment that you would thrive in, right? So first we wanna think about the size of the organization. Small, medium, large. Where do you picture yourself? Where do you thrive in, in what size organization? Lots of pros and cons about smaller organizations or larger. Um, where do you feel like you thrive? And you may not know yet, but what's your initial gut reaction right now? And you could come up with a range too of like what feels good um, in that range. You can also think about the pace, fast pace, medium pace, slow pace. How do you want to feel in the pace of the environment or the pace of the work? Do you want to travel? Maybe what percent of your time do you want to travel? Um, do you want to be remote? Do you want to be hybrid? Do you want to be in person? 
And really, what traits of the people do you want to work with, right? What personality of that organization? What's the culture? What are the values? What's the vibe? What, what should that team have collectively in terms of the values? Uh, and this isn't just values on paper. This is values that you can see that they have proven to exhibit those traits in that culture. What do you need or want out of that group? And you can close your eyes and picture it. Sometimes our visual nature of ourselves just can see it. Do you see yourself like sort of walking around and meeting with people? Or do you see like a co-working space? Or do you see a corporate environment? Or do you see it like an education environment? Or do you see a healthcare setting? Or I mean, there's any number of things you might see, who you're talking to, what's on the whiteboard, you know, what's happening? What, what can you see? Sometimes that visual nature gives us like a bit of an intuition on what we're craving out of our next professional opportunity. So I'm going to just share quickly one more time. Let me just reopen up my slides quickly. Um, and let's see here. Let me know if you guys can see it. Uh, here we go. Okay, so if your career search isn't fun, your job won't be either. So I know that job search is effort and it is hard, but you should enjoy the networking of what you're doing and who you're meeting and the skill development. If you're not enjoying the research and what you're looking into and all of what goes into the nature of those efforts, uh, then we need to rethink about what it is you're applying for. Right, we want you to feel aligned, and this is one signal as to how to check in with: Am I enjoying what I'm even looking into? Right, and just super quickly, just so you know who we are. Um, I think uh, Cheryl's going to help share out the links of who we are, so you can get in touch with us. But uh, at Woken, this is what we do: we guide you through all these different processes, what to do, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it, why to do it, and just give you that support and accountability along the way, so that you can achieve all your career goals efficiently and effectively. Um, so I will sort of pause my sharing and answer some questions. How do you get a feel for a company's culture if you don't know people there? Good question. Um, you kind of need to network, honestly, to get the vibe of the culture. So I think your question is more like, how do we get an introduction? Now, you might get the vibe, first of all, in an interview. You should definitely just assess how people treat you in the interview process as far as even down to the recruiter emailing you in a timely, polite fashion. Like you can literally assess how you feel completely in that interview process. You know, the pace, does it feel chaotic? Are they rescheduling on you? Like you can literally look at the full process, including, of course, the vibe of the, you know, what you get from the interviewers. How are they speaking to you? You know, just do you get along? What's the rapport and the vibe like? Um, but in an ideal world, you would try to get a networking introduction. So you want to be creative with networking. Like, who's your network's network? Let's be unassuming that you may know someone who knows somebody. LinkedIn is a great tool to research and find mutual shared connections that you might not have known. Like, oh, I know this person and they know someone who works at that company. So use LinkedIn. And as long as you're connected to your network, you'll be able to see if you have those shared connections. Um, but we can also just be open-minded and ask around, do you happen to know anybody who works there? Another thing could be alumni networks are so powerful, right? If you attended undergraduate, really try to make sure you find that alumni network in LinkedIn. And it's another great way of seeing, do I have a warm connection? and something in common with someone who might work there. Maybe I don't really know them, but if we have the same alma mater, makes them a little bit more inclined to want to help me and chat with me. So do your best to try to get an introduction. Um, be open-minded, use tech ladies, you know, use um, all the communities that you can to see if you can get an introduction. You can get the vibe from the interview, but the best way of getting like an honest take on a culture is in a networking call. Um, of course, you can read things online, but I don't personally think it's the number one way. Like you might read one thing on Glassdoor that was like the one person seven years ago that had like some bad situation. And perhaps the people they were working with don't even work there anymore. Like online could be helpful, but like I just think, you know, those 
person to person conversations are the best possible thing you can do. And then of course we could talk about, all right, what are the creative things you can ask? When you're asking about culture, you really wanna get specific and not just say, what's the culture? Really figure out what do you want and how can you like ask them to give you stories or examples of like how and when they've exhibited that before. Um, just the same way they ask you, tell me about a time. You can do the same thing, right? You don't want to ask a broad question and then just get a fluffy answer. Um, try to get specific and creative and creative when you ask it so that you get real information and examples back that you can use to gauge how do they stack up against what I'm looking for. I hope that helps. Any other questions? Yes, I see one. Uh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, I see one. Um, any tips for working very remotely, like in another country? Um, so it sounds like what you're saying to me is when you're working and your team is in another country, or are you trying to move to another country? Um, feel free to add any context to clarify, but I think you are saying the first thing, which is just tips on working well with a remote team in another country. Um, so, and yeah, again, feel free to chime in if I'm going in the wrong track. Um, when you're working remotely, uh, this is definitely still new, I think for a lot of us, um, you do wanna really make sure you're collaborating uh, closely. Uh, and so, oh, I see, moving abroad, hope to find a new role. Okay, I was on the wrong track. So if you are moving abroad and hope to find a new role, Honestly, I think a lot of the same job search best practices apply. Obviously, you would have to understand the logistics of like a work visa and like how that works. And are there certain companies that sponsor that international work visa or not? So you really want to just deeply do your research, maybe try to find some other foreigners or expats who move to that country. I'm a huge fan of just networking as a way of learning, you know, get their tips really from the horse's mouth of kind of people who have done it before. But other than that, you know, networking, I usually recommend networking as at least 50% of your time in job search. Um, so, so getting your foot in the door, meeting people in your target organizations. Um, of course, there's applying online, doing research, doing upskilling, doing webinars, like all the things you would be doing in job search anyway. I think you just want to make sure you have an understanding of any specific requirements or logistics, you know, for that company and, or sorry, for that country. And if that changes, which companies you might target based on who's going to sponsor expats type of a thing, right? Hopefully that helps. Uh, I'm going to see what else we have here. Um, so <clears throat> contemplating doing other trainings such as Salesforce in the interim while working on my user research skills. The reason is so I can get work and build a network with folks in the Salesforce field. So if you're debating further like skill development, I would, um, I, I do think it's a good way of potentially meeting people, but if you're gonna do something like Salesforce, I would just make sure that's really what you want. Like I, I personally think it's probably only worthwhile to go after a Salesforce training if you are hoping to work with Salesforce. Um, so sorry, you have access to more Salesforce people who are opening doors. Yeah, I personally think you would network just through the best practices of networking, meaning understanding how and where to identify and research people, how to properly reach out and phrase your outreach so that they actually answer you, understanding how to run those informational calls and how to move from a networking call to an interview. So I don't personally think like doing a training is your number one way to just network to get a job. I think it's like a slightly indirect thing. I would rather you do skill development that is related to the skills they need to see from you 
whether that's formal training or building up project portfolios, whether it's pro bono work or whatever it may be. Skill development is meant to build skills so that you can prove your capabilities of doing that job. Networking, on the other hand, there's different ways of just simply getting your foot in the door, getting introductions, using alumni networks, warm connections, figuring out how to reach out to someone properly so that you can land networking meetings. Um, I think those two would be different. So that's just my two cents. I wouldn't want you to like waste time in a training that isn't relevant for you. Um, I can understand why you might think it would like open doors, but I personally think you want to use your skill development time wisely and then use your networking time wisely as well. Any other questions? I'm so glad, Heather. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, happy to hang out for another minute, but if not, I hope this was helpful. Stay in touch. We, I know today was, you know, a, a paid session. Uh, uh, we often do a lot of free things as well, in addition, just through my organization and hopefully with Tech Ladies, we will continue to partner as well. So, you know, just stay in touch, you know, on our website, we always hope to put out more resources to, to be as helpful as humanly possible on social, whether it's blogs or downloadable guides and resources, videos, um, events and webinars. So just, uh, you know, stay in touch. Um, we will put that link one more time here for you guys. Um, yes, and we've got that recording too. So yeah, stay in touch. Uh, of course, we'd always love to help. Uh, careers can be a, a big thing, an important thing, sometimes stressful, but we're here to try to make it as easy and manageable to achieve your potential. And I know there's a lot that goes into that. So if you're looking for any support and you know one-on-one -on -one guidance, uh, we're, we're here. But in addition to that, we try to put out a lot on the website as well. Awesome. Cheryl, uh, I think we're good. If you have anything else, let me know. If not, I think we can wrap up a few minutes early for, for today, but I hope everyone today enjoyed and got value and will stay in touch. And we are always here to help. So take care guys. And uh, hopefully we will see you soon.